I'm Tom and in this video I'll be building this ESP home sensor so I can monitor the temperature of the flow and return pipes connected to my boiler. I've chosen ESP home for this particular project instead of writing my own code as it's far more accessible to people who don't program. It gives me everything I need and is very easy to connect to Home Assistant. There's loads of info on getting started on their website and I'll include a link to that in the description below. So how are we going to read the temperature of the pipes coming out of and back into the boiler? Traditionally, or very commonly, people would use one of these. This is a DS18B20 digital thermometer. It talks to the control units using a digital signal using something called a one wire protocol and essentially each one of these is has a unique address and it'll send signals down this wire and then we run that through a library and that will give us um, a reading it'll convert the digital signals into a reading uh, you can have plenty lots of these connected in in parallel or in series and as each one is a unique address it's quite flexible it's digital as well so there's not much uh, there's not much calibration or anything because these are all these are pre-calibrated and they're quite easy to connect up but what I don't like about them is is how they connect with the pipe so if we imagine this represents the circumference of a copper pipe when we put these two things in contact there's actually very little contact between them so I always think that impacts the measurement that this device provides because there's only a very small surface area of contact. So if I have a pipe at 55 and it's put in contact with this, most of this isn't going to be at 55 and I think that confuses the probe. People get around this by using thermal paste and they do things like wrapping copper pipe, copper wire around this. But I've never really been happy with that. I think it's a lot of faffing. So for this video, I'm going to use one of these. Now this is an NTC thermistor, uh, specifically designed to be clamped onto a pipe. Now these differ from the, uh, the, the digital probes because they're essentially analog. Um, NTC thermistors walk off the principle that they provide uh, a resistance across these two probes across these, sorry I keep hitting the camera, they, they provide a resistance across these two terminals and as the temperature increases the resistance decreases. So once you've got an idea of what the resistance measurement is at a particular temperature you can then work out based on the changes in resistance what the temperature is. I'm going to use this one in this video, uh, I'm going to use two of them um, I haven't tried these out before. Um, I have used a similar one in my radiator project uh, and that looks like this. Uh, so this has kind of got a little bit more, it's a little bit nicer looking really um, and it's a far more adjustable so you can kind of tighten it to different, uh, to different circumferences of pipes. But it's the same principle, it's got a copper area here which contacts and then it provides a resistance reading. I've had these in a box for a couple of months, so I'm keen to try them out. Uh, this one will fit a 22mm pipe, which is perfect for the primaries I have in my boiler. And this is what I'm going to use. A couple of things about NTCs. They're typically calibrated. So the, uh, the spec sheet for the, the different May, the different ones, will typically give you uh, a resistance at a fixed temperature. That's normally, uh, say, 25 degrees C, uh, and it's normally 10 kilo ohms, at least in the ones that I've come across. So if you are getting a 10 kilo ohm resistance measurement, you know that this is in contact with something that's at 25 degrees. They also have uh, something called a beta value, which is like, uh, they're non they're, because they're non-linear, which means the, the temperature and that doesn't change in a straight line, there's an adjustment you make to compensate for 
the temperatures at both ends of the spectrum. So it, that will vary depending on the, the unit you have. And once you've got a measurement of the resistance and you know this beta value and the calibration setup, you feed that into something called a Steinhardt calculation, I think it's called, and then that will spit out um, a temperature in degrees C that we can use. Now, as these units are analog, they're going to provide a, a, a reading. Traditionally, what we will do is we will use um, something called a voltage divider. So that means we pair this resistor, which is essentially a resistor, with the resist another resistor, normally at the calibration value, and then we read, we use this voltage divider to give us a voltage measurement. So when they're equal, the voltage divider will give us a, a very predictable reading. But that means that we need to be able to convert a voltage measurement into something our microcontroller can use. So we need to use something called an analog to digital converter. So I was originally going to use uh, an expressive A2C6 board. This is a, a Wemos D1 Mini, it's called. It's a really cool little board. Uh, this chip's got built-in Wi-Fi. It's got a nice little aerial on it. Um, but it only supports one analog to digital channel. And because I have two probes, one for flow and one for return, I needed something that has more than one. Um, the standard ESP32 has, I think, five or six um, analog to digital converters built into it. But this is a workhorse. It's, it's very powerful. Uh, two cores and stuff, so it's overkill for this, I think. So what I've settled on is one of these. Now, this is an ESP32 C3, and it's like a little cut-down version of the ESP32. It's only got a single core, but it has the same number of analog-to-digital converters, and it's perfect for this. This particular model is a Cedar from the Seed Studio, uh, and it comes with a built-in antenna, which will make Wi-Fi access a bit easier when this is installed in my garage, and it's programmed via a USB-C connector. So this is what I'm going to use for this project, and we'll simply connect our two sensors with our voltage dividers into the analog to digital converter pins along the side. If you want to know more about how voltage dividers work, plenty of articles online. I, I won't go into it too, in too much detail, uh, but for now, let's get everything mounted on the breadboard and get it connected together. Just actually one thing before we jump over to the breadboard. Um, because these are analog um, and we're not going to really have access to a pipe sitting at my desk, I want to be able to sort of test this test the, um, the code is working through ESP Home. So what I'm going to do is use something called a potentiometer. So this is essentially a variable resistor. Uh, you can see up there it's, it's, it's rated at 20k, so that's 20 kilo ohms. And as you turn on this little dial, it'll change the resistance that it provides. So in a way, it's exactly the same as one of these. So we can essentially set this to 10 kilo ohms, which would be the resistance given by one of these at 25 degrees. And then we can use that to check it's reading the value correctly. And then we can also see how that responds in terms of publishing that to Home Assistant. So we'll get this mounted up now. All right, so here we are with the breadboard set up. I've already inserted the ESP32 and I've connected its 3.3 volt output and its ground to the common rail on the breadboard. I've also connected it to the PC so you can see the little red lights on so that's currently getting power. Before I wire this in I just wanted to spend a minute just talking about the voltage divider. Now there's loads of information about these online plenty of resources but I just wanted to give a quick run through of, of how it's going to work in terms of the thermistor itself. So 
if we imagine or if we put in a 10k resistor and then I'm going to use another 10k resistor here to simulate the to simulate the, the thermistor itself what we want to do is introduce a voltage across both resistors so I'll connect the ground to the leg on one and I'll connect the 3.3 volts to the leg on the other and I've got my multimeter here beside me so if we want to just quickly see what that looks like um, I'm just going to put the uh, the ground into the ground rail and then I'll put that in there it's just so we can see there's exactly 3.3 volts coming off the ESP32 which is perfect um, and if we now measure where the two resistors join because they are both 10k this should essentially have the voltage so you can see now we're getting 1.65 volts which is precisely half so we know now that if we know this resistor is 10k whatever this value is we can work it out based upon the voltage that we get back as I mentioned I'm going to use a potentiometer to kind of simulate this initially so we can pop that in now so I will replace this resistor pop him out and then I'll pop in so there's three legs uh, I think these are kind of common ones they're common and then the other two I don't really know where there's three to be honest but we'll, we'll plug it in push that in like that tricky to get to the breadboard and then I'll measure the wire the ground into the center pin the multimeter is going to sleep we'll turn that back on and now you can see we're currently getting 1.2 volts so as I adjust this you can see the voltage is going up and down and if I bring this back up to 1.65 very slowly very slowly so that's now 1.65 so this means now that this should have a resistance reading of 10 kilo ohms so I'm going to disconnect it switch my multimeter to ohms maybe not 20 million 20k and I'll connect him there and him there and we should get a reading of bang on 10 kilo ohms so hopefully that gives you an idea of what role the kind of the voltage divider will provide so again this thing kind of simulates the thermistor so it will provide the varying voltage I'm oh, sorry the varying resistance and then we can read that resistance using the analog to digital converter uh, we sort of read in the voltage run it through that Steinhardt algorithm that I mentioned and that will give us the resistance which we can essentially convert to temperature so I'm going to leave this in here for now and make sure that that's still wired up and now I'm going to connect the center so the middle of the voltage divider to analog one so the pinout for this this starts at analog zero and runs up to like analog five so we'll tell ESP home take that one out we'll tell ESP home to use analog one when it's taking its reading there is a reason I've chosen analog one uh, and that's because I have a, a little circuit board that's been designed for a, another one of my projects and it turns out that this was originally designed for um, a Nordic board an NRF 52840 but it turns out the pinouts for the analog and the power etc are identical um, because it's the same make as the, it's the same seed company that make both of those chips so I'll actually hopefully be able to reuse this little PCB um, when I come to mount this that's a, a project for another day um, so what we're going to do now is we'll jump over to my PC and we'll take a look at how we can put ESP home onto the uh, onto this little device and we'll hopefully be able to get a reading 
ultimately of 25 degrees from this because we know this is now set to 10,000 and once we can kind of show that that's working we'll swap it out for an actual thermistor which we will pop onto a pipe we can then essentially connect this up um, or we'll add uh, and then we can get that reading into home assistant all right so here we are in vs code and i've got my project file open so this is uh, available up on github and i'll include a link in the notes description i've got a simple yaml file uh, which contains the definition uh, of my sensor and i also have esp home already installed uh, I won't go into the details of, of how to do that. Um, all the information is up on the ESP Home website, so I'll leave that as an exercise to you to, to figure that out. So what I want to do is take you through the, the different parts of the sensor configuration, and then we'll flash that onto the board, and then we can jump into Home Assistant <clears throat> and see those measurements coming through. After that, then we can go down and actually clip this in and see it actually reading the real sensor values of the real temperatures. Uh, so let's get cracking in this file. So there's a couple of main bits that I want to cover. Uh, so if we start at the very top, um, this is kind of the main required node for ESP Home. And it just gives us the ability to give the sensor a name. So this is a friendly name that would appear in home assistant uh, you've got to use hyphens uh, if you want to use them in the name uh, underscores cause havoc with um, the, the sort of mini dns or micro dns um, so i've just called mine boiler flow and return sensor and then there's some platform io options uh, which just tell it how to how it can flash to the device and then we finally give it the board name which is an ESP 32 C3 uh, we also then have some kind of board specific stuff that needs to go in uh, so I got these off the, the seed website um, it just tells it some exact details about the board the variant of the ESPs a couple of different uh, units as I outlined and then finally the framework so we're going to be using the expressive IDF which is their uh, development environment uh, you can use Arduino here, I think, but I'm not sure how well that works with the analog to digital stuff. So I've just gone with the ESP IDF. Uh, next on the list is the Wi-Fi. So this basically configures the SSID and password uh, so that the <clears throat> sensor can connect to your, your local Wi-Fi. Um, now, I'm using a secrets file here. Uh, so that I don't have to push my Wi-Fi and password up to GitHub. Um, and it also means I can change can change that stuff uh, locally so it's not committed to my, to my GitHub repo. So I've got a little sample. I won't obviously show you my secrets file um, in case you have any desire to crack into my Wi-Fi, but I'll show you a sample. Uh, so this just looks like this. Uh, you, you set the keys and you set the values. So if you were to use this yourself, you'd put your own Wi-Fi SSID in there, your own Wi-Fi password, and then the API key, which I'll come to, it's a later a later section, you just fill in the value for that, that's just a string. Um, so jumping back, so that's accessed then by using this high, uh, exclamation mark secret format. This comes from uh, Home Assistant, I think. So there I've just set it to use my Wi-Fi SSID, my Wi-Fi password, uh, next up we've got logger uh, this just tells it how it's going to communicate with the device so we're using the jtag interface which comes with it's baked into that won't we'll go into that in detail uh, next is the api so this just provides an encryption key uh, for home assistant so that when it's talking back and forth the, the payloads are kind of encrypted uh, it's a symmetric key so you only have to provide one value. And as you can see there, that's the API key that I mentioned. So that's coming from the secrets file. That covers the kind of the baseline stuff that we need to get set up. So 
next thing now I'm going to move on is to the actual sensor itself. So I'll outline one of these. Um, ultimately, we will have two for both flow and return. But if I start with just one, and what I'll actually do is start at the bottom of this section here. So if you remember earlier in the video, I talked about uh, how we would take the resistance, essentially turn that into a, or, or, yeah, take the value from the, the thermistor. We would then work out what the resistance is um, using the, the voltage divider. And then we would take that and convert it into a temperature. So at the very bottom here, we define the analog to digital converter. So this will basically read in the voltage that's coming from the voltage divider. Um, I've called this the flow source sensor. So that that's just to kind of give it a, a nice name. Uh, and that's on pin three, which corresponds to the A1 uh, on the ESP32 C3. It's gonna update every five seconds. And I'm using this attenuation value of 11, 11 decibels. And this is something that's particular to the ESP32. As I understand it, the ESP32's analog to digital converter um, will only work between zero and one volt, uh, which would, wouldn't normally be a problem, but we're using the voltage divider with a reference voltage of the 3.3 volts, which is what we get from, which is what we can read out of the, uh, the ESP32. So in order to sort of proportionally adjust from zero to one volts, so it's reading or it's returning then voltages between zero and 3.3 volts, we can give it this attenuation value. And the ESP32 then will effectively multiply the values up. So if it, if it receives um, a kind of a value up at one, it's, it's basically able to run that through some sort of an internal divider or something. And it'll basically convert uh, the values that it reads in into the proper reference value we want. So if we feed in 3.3, we need to be able to read 3.3. Uh, it's also worth noting that when you're using these attenuation values, there are limits placed on the upper, uh, the kind of the upper value. So uh, as again, from what I know, uh, when we're using an attenuation of 11, it can only read up to 2.77 volts. So if we were to feed in 3.3 volts, um, we, the ADC would only report 2.77. Now, as we're typically gonna be working down around two volts, I think when your flow temperature is up in the, in the kind of the 50s or the 60s, that that's not gonna matter. Um, whether we whether we're up at 2.5 or 2.6 so i think we're okay i think if i remember correctly those sensors are ranked up to a couple of hundred degrees so that means that the range uh, we would never come close to that so it, we should be okay uh, so once we've got our voltage value coming in uh, the next thing we need to do then is convert that to a resistance value so this uh, section here, this resistance platform, um, this essentially works out what the voltage divider, using the voltage divider, what the other resistance value would be. So it, it defaults to uh, a reference voltage of 3.3 volts uh, for the ESP32, and then we tell it that we've got a resistor of 10 kilo ohms. So the output of this sensor then will be an actual resistance. Um, so when I discussed this in the, earlier in the video, if we've got two resistors at 10K, the reference voltage will be 1.65 coming into the ADC. So what this would do is then spit out at 10 kilo ohms. So it would know how to convert the, the analog value into the resistance. And then with that resistance, we then jump up into this uh, which is our NTC. So this is essentially this sort of Steinhardt formula I've been mentioning. We basically give it the sensor, which is the resistance. So the input into this is essentially the, is the resistance value. Uh, then we've got the different constant values. We've got the beta constant, the reference temperature, uh, and the reference resistance. 
Now, to get our hands on these values, I just thought it'd be useful to show you where I've actually sourced that from. So the clamp I showed in the video is one of these. It's a 103FT 7Y045. So I fed that into Google um, and to pick the first link that I found and I came across its data sheet. So if we open its data sheet, we'll be looking for the actual NTC specification. So if you take a closer look at this, you can see that this is our R25 value, which is 10 kilo ohms. And then this one here, which is R2585, this is essentially the beta value that I was talking about. So it's 3969. This also gives you an idea of the operating temperatures that I mentioned. So this will feed uh, resistances up to 120 degrees. Um, and it's got a particular accuracy, so it will tell you that how far the reading will be out. Um, again, once we're up, you're up into 85, 90, we're not, we're not going to be dealing in temperatures that, or at least I hope we won't be dealing in temperatures that high. Um, so that's where I get those values from. So the two ones we want to note um, is the resistance at 25, and then we need this sort of um, resistance value there, or this, or this beta value, sorry, it's not resistance values, it's a beta value, um, which is 3969. So we, we've taken those, I've already taken those and punched them in. So we'll hop back to VS Code. So there's that 3969, that's fit in, that's my 25, and that's my 10 kilo ohms. So we're essentially all set up with this sensor. Um, if I scroll down inside the file, I've gone ahead and defined um, a second sensor here, but we're not going to use that for now, um, but it will appear. Actually, something I've just noticed missing um, is this little internal flag. It's actually been put in the wrong place. So um, I need to take this one off here, sorry. So. This is a handy little thing to know if you're doing ESP, ESP Home. Uh, this internal flag will basically hide the sensor from a Home Assistant if you've connected it up. So having the resistance value appear in Home Assistant is kind of pointless. Uh, what you're really interested in is the actual temperature. So by turning this on, it'll essentially hide that. It won't create an entity. So I've, I've set that up for both of those. Um, I also think that should be pin. No, oh, that's matter. So, with that, um, the next step now is to flash this on to um, the device. So, to make things a little bit easier, I'm going to comment this one out. So you can just use the, um, the hash commenting, and we'll save that file. So, <clears throat> I've got my board connected, and. What we'll do now <clears throat> is go through the steps to actually put this onto onto the ESP32. So ESP Home is command line based, uh, which is great. Uh, so what we need to do is open a terminal. We'll hop into our ESP Home directory, which is where our file is located. <clears throat> and the first thing we need to do is compile this file. So what the compilation step does is it takes the sensor definition that we've got in the YAML file, and it turns it into firmware that runs on the ESP Home. So we'll do ESP Home, the command we want is compile, and then we'll feed it the name of our file, which is our boiler flow's return sensor YAML, and we'll hit enter. Now, the first time you run this, it may take an awfully long time um, as it will download all the libraries and platforms and everything that it needs. So don't worry about that. It can take, it can take 15 minutes because um, it's it may have to download the entire ESP IDF, which is not small. So we let that run, and that will compile all the stuff that we need. You, you, if you look at that, you can see various different libraries and things being pulled in. And what we'll end up with at the end is things like an ELF file, it's called. My kids have decided to start listening to the 
Disney Cars soundtrack, which I can hear playing quite loudly from their bedroom. Okay, so the compilation is finished. Uh, a couple of things just to note. You can see there, that's our ELF file, which is the actual uh, firmware. And then it will give us an idea of how much space it's taking up on the device. Mm. This can become important if you've got quite a big uh, firmware file. So we're not going to worry about that for now. And that's it. So we're, we're good to go. Next, we want to do is actually flash this uh, onto the device. So we do ESP Home, and we just type Upload, and then we give it our file name again, file name again. And now this probably will prompt you. Um, it may not. I've got two ESP Home devices connected. So what I'm looking for is COM6. COM4 is my <clears throat> radiator monitor. So that's, that's currently ticking away. So this is the one I want, it's number two. And it does not like that. Don't you hate it when this happens, <laughs> doing a screen recording. Um, so it's not able to find the binary. And I wonder if that might be to do with the length of the path. It's quite long, or the length of the sensor name. I've got some inkling at the back of my mind that there actually is a limit. So let's try that. I'll, I'll rename the sensor. Uh, we'll try this again, see if that will fix the problem. So I've got, it is quite a long name. There's actually nearly 30 characters. So let's just change this. Um, we'll have a bit of childish humor here. We'll call it a fart sensor. Uh, fart here is flow and return temperatures. I haven't, I didn't think of that off the cuff. I've been using that um, as a back end name for a different project. So I'll save that file. We'll, uh, let's just clear the terminal again. We'll make that a bit bigger. And we'll run that uh, build step again, the compile step again. This will probably recompile it from scratch. Let that run. Ba, ba, ba. <laughs> Waiting for my code to compile. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's been waiting to come out. All right, moment of truth. Let's do the uh, the upload step now, which is just the same. Tom six, hopefully. Okay, so that's what it was. It was just the name it was too long. I didn't think long file names, uh, long path names, were a thing in Windows anymore, but it obviously is. So it's successfully uploaded. Uh, the last thing we can do now. Oh, the final thing is to is to access the logs. So again, this is quite easy. There's a logs command, and you feed it the name. Now at this point, you can see that you now have another option, which is over the air. So once you've configured Wi-Fi or some sort of network connection inside your 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 sensor definition, the system will then assume that you now can access the device uh, over the air using a a local uh, route, but we're going to use the, the com uh, just for ease. And we should see some, okay, so uh, as expected, and amazingly, I guess that's working now. So it's sending out, uh, if you kind of look at this, you can see it's reading resistance of 9736.8 ohms which is converting into a temperature of 25.5 so that's actually very close um we did in the earlier in the video we did actually adjust that resistance to be bang on 10 kilo ohms but in my experience it's never going to be um exactly precise so there's going to be some rounding happening in the adc uh, there's going to be some noise just 
electrical noise um, leaking out of the, the, the unit itself or the the, 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 the ESP32 itself. And I guess the other kind of important thing is that the reference resistor, which I put in, isn't exactly 10 kilo ohms. So that's just something to bear in mind. When you buy resistors, they'll have a variance value on them, and that can be as much as 20%. The more expensive the resistor, I think the lower on the variance. And the variance is just um, how far off the, the specified resistance it could be. So I know for a fact that uh, the resistor that I've got on my board is only about 9.8 kilo ohms. So again, I, I could change my reference to 9.8 that would give me a tighter uh, ref sorry a tighter reference voltage and i probably will do that at some point but for now being half a degree out it's not the end of the world and that i think is enough accuracy for what we're trying to do half a degree here half a degree there it's not going to make a big deal when you're monitoring sort of 50 degrees or 55 or 60 degree flow temperature or return temperature. So that's great. Um, we've got that working now. The next step is to add this sensor into Home Assistant. So we'll jump into Home Assistant now. Here we are in Home Assistant. And what we'll do now is we'll jump into settings, jump into devices and services. And you may notice that we've got a discovered ESP Home. Now, one thing I've noticed with ESP Home is if you reuse a particular device like this ESP32, or you re you've done it with ESP Home before and you've changed the name, it seems to somehow just cache the old name. So this is just showing me boiler for some reason. Uh, we can configure it this way, or we can click, uh, sorry, we can click the add integration. We can choose ESP Home, and it will essentially tell us why it's discovered. So in this instance, I know that this is the, uh, the sensor, it's the only one I've got. So I'll click discovered, and it says, do you want to add? And I'll say submit. And now it will ask me for the encryption keys. So if you remember earlier, in our YAML file, we defined an encryption key. And I'm going to grab mine from my secrets file. If you can see, and I'll paste that in, and now you can see it. <laughs> so that it doesn't really matter, this is only used locally. Uh, I must reach out to Home Assistant and ask them to protect that. Uh, so I'll click Submit, and you can see that it actually has picked up the right name. So it's picked up my fart sensor. That's fine. We don't need to put it in an area. And I'll click Finish. And if we now, oh, yeah, if we now scroll down, we should find ESP Home. We've got a single device. And you can see it's pulling in our flow temperature at 25.5, which mirrors what was logged. And I can now adjust the potentiometer. And you can see that the sensor will update. Now remember, the ADC is only being read once every five seconds. So this isn't going to respond in real time. And if I scroll, if I twist it the other way, you can see the temperature going that way. So that's all working, um, aside from that hiccup with the long name. That's added in. So what we'll do now is we'll hop back into VS Code and we'll set up the second sensor. And then I'll show you how that's wired up on the breadboard. Now, if you'll remember, when we first looked at our YAML file, I mentioned that we already had um, a sensor configured. So all I need to do is uncomment that. And it's essentially the same, except we're just using return resistance, boiler return temperature, but everything else is exactly the same in terms of the constants and everything. So with that done, all we need to do is 
compile it. And upload it exactly as we did before. And if we check Home Assistant, we'll see that the sensor has been added automatically. Now, this will get an unpredictable reading as we haven't actually added the second potentiometer to the breadboard. So let's add that now. Right, back at the breadboard and I'll pop the second potentiometer in. So I'll just line them up there, pop them in up there. All right. And it's the same kind of deal. We'll take one leg from here. I think that pops in. I think it's the, oh, this is quite fiddly. So we just check that's lined up. Yep. And we'll take power to the other leg like so, and then we'll take the output of the voltage divider and we'll pop that across here. So we'll three, four, so we'll pop that into pin four. I've just noticed I haven't actually soldered that pin in. So I'll do that. All right, soldered that in. So we should have a good connection now between these two. Uh, you may be wondering, why I haven't actually soldered all these header pins in and it's because I intend to take the little header pins out so that I can mount this unit um, on one of my little PCBs at some point so it just makes it easier if I only have to unsolder four terminals as opposed to whatever like 12. So that's the circuit completed um, again for testing I'm just using the potentiometer but in when we get closer to the end, we'll start using the thermistor there. With the potentiometer added, you'll see Home Assistant is now reporting a much more reasonable value of 28.3. And if we adjust that potentiometer now on the board manually, we can see the value going up and down. We're almost at the end now. That's the sort of breadboard prototype working We've got the ESP home code set up. What we need to do now is replace the potentiometers with the actual NTC clamps. I'm going to use uh, two screw terminals for that. So that allows me to basically put them into the breadboard and then I can connect the, the sensor cables, the sensor wires into those terminals and, and tighten those closed. That just allows me a little bit of freedom uh, and it's plus it makes it easier to actually join those cables into the breadboard. So this is the little terminal I'm talking about. It's just got two screws at the top. Um, it takes two inputs and we'll just drop this in instead of each potentiometer. So we'll take the potentiometer out and you can see what we want to do is line that up. We'll push that into the board like so. We'll do the same on the other side. Now this one I already have kind of got my, and if we line up the pins. So now this is essentially, the clamp is now the resistor instead of the potentiometer. So the wiring is, is exactly identical. I'll need to make up another one of these um, clamps with some cables on it, but we're now ready to basically go down to the garage and clamp these things onto the pipes of the boiler and get some actual readings. So we're down in the garage on top of the boiler here and I've connected the thermistors to the flow and return pipes that go into the boiler. Now I happen to know which ones are the flow and return because this is not the first time I've attached sensors <laughs> to these pipes as you can see from some of the, the tape. Um, 
if you don't know which is which, basically when you turn your heating on, the flow will be the pipe that warms up first, followed by the return. Uh, and the time it takes the, re the return to start warming will depend on how long the heating circuit is, so how long it takes that warm water to start circulating back to the boiler. If you try this yourself and you get it wrong, obviously don't worry, you can just swap the probes around until you, uh, you get the right pipes. At that point then it's useful to just mark them. Um, I've marked mine on the wall over there, so you know which is which. So with the thermistors attached, it's time to test this thing out. So to test this is all working, I've updated my heating dashboard and I've added my flow temperature and return temperature sensors into this boiler temperatures panel. And what I will do now is turn on the heating and we should see both the flow temperature and return temperature rise. Uh, I can control this directly from Home Assistant as I've set up uh, sent some Shelly relays to actually monitor the heating. I removed my smart thermostat a couple of weeks ago. Um, I've done a video on that if you're interested and I'll, I'll put a link to that as well in the description. But for now I'm just going to turn the heating on. This is the moment of truth. And after a few seconds we should see the burner power panel here increase. The call for heating is now detected. So that means the, the valve should be opening and the boiler will be having a think. It typically starts by circulating, starting to circulate the water. Now interestingly that flow temperature has dropped a little bit. This is probably going to be hopping around the place. Okay, so the, the burner has started. That's its minimum, which is good. So we should now see this temperature rise. So I'll let this run for, let's say, 15 minutes, and then we'll check back in and see what the flow and return temperatures are like. All right, so this has been running now for 20 minutes, and both the flow temperature and return temperature have actually dropped. So that leads me to believe that I've made a mistake somewhere. Whilst I was waiting, I, I, I did notice that this was dropping. So I had a look at the, um, the videos or the recordings I'd done just to check the wiring and everything in the wiring looks okay. I've got an example of voltage divider here, what it would look like. So this kind of mirror is what we have. We've got the voltage in, which is our 3.3 volts, that goes into the variable resistor here, which is our thermistor. And then we read the value out with the reference resistor going to ground. I've double checked that. So the wiring on the breadboard is correct. So I kind of did a bit more thinking, a bit more reading. And what I've realized, what I, or what I didn't account for, was the configuration in ESP Home. Now, if we hop over the VS Code, that's Home Assistant, if we hop over to VS Code, and we look at our sensor, we've got our resistance sensor set up here with the resistor, but what I hadn't accounted for, or what I didn't pay any attention to at the time, was this configuration. Now, when you've got a voltage divider, it's important to know which one of the resistors is changing. So when this is set to downstream, it means that the ESP home sensor is assuming this is the voltage that's very, or this is the resistor that's variable. And that's not the case. It's the one up above it is variable. So what we actually need is to set this to upstream for both of these and that will t that basically tells the sensor then basically corrects the configuration uh, this will tally so it sort of does explain why we're seeing the voltage drop or not the voltage the temperature drop um, because it's assuming 
the wrong resistor is changing, so it's computing the wrong uh, resistance value, which in turn computes the wrong temperature. Uh, as I've changed this, I've also noticed that I didn't include the over-the-air setup, unfortunately, so that means I can't remotely update this ESP home, uh, which means I've got to run down to the garage, disconnect the sensor, bring it up, plug it in, update it, run back downstairs and plug it back in. Uh, so for future reference, uh, I think it's something like this. I think there's another key or two, but I'll get that added in and push that change up so you will be able to leverage the remote over the air update. That would have been a useful thing to demo, but unfortunately I didn't have it in there correctly. So I'll um, I'll run down and get the sensor and connect it up and we should then hopefully see the temperature move in the right direction. Flashed, reinstalled, and you'll immediately see the temperatures now look far more like should. Um, the heating has turned off and I, I guess that's the climate control has decided now it's warm enough so it's actually switched the heating off. But these readings are kind of up where I'd expect them to be, which means we are in business. A couple of things left to do um, on the project itself. So there's a few improvements um, I'd like to make, I think, going from this that I've kind of noted down. So first one would be to try and reduce the, the noise in the, the reading. Um, maybe put some sort of an average in there or something that will kind of smooth out. Um, the reading because it does hop around and I think that's um, that's the ADC itself and how it samples that voltage reading and because we're using the attenuation um, that's it's kind of having to amplify that value almost in a way to get us up to the 3.3 reference voltage so that's something I'd like to see if ESP home could do I have a PCB design um, which I've done for as I mentioned, I think I showed it earlier in the in the video. I've done that for a Nordic board, so it needs a slight tweak um, to make it suitable for using with this ESP board, and that's just to do with the position of the the ADC pins. There's not as many, so I would need to just rework that circuitry. So I'll probably have to give that a go um, and maybe get some of them printed up. And if you're interested, um, yeah, maybe I can can sell them or something if people want to, to, to have a go at this themselves. Um, I obviously need to put all that in a case as well, so I think that kind of goes hand in hand with the, the PCB. So it'd be nice to kind of produce a, a case for that. And then uh, lastly, I think it's just looking at that reference resistor um, and seeing what sort of difference it would make if I filled in the correct value instead of just rounding it up to the, the 10,000 kilo ohms. So I'll pro probably do those, make, make, have a go at some of those over the next few weeks. So I'll keep an eye on these temperatures uh, over the, the course of the next couple of days once the, uh, the heating sort of turns itself on. Uh, this is getting quite cold. And I'll be just curious to see um, how well this value here matches what the, the boiler reports from the EMS integration that I've got. I've done, I've done a video on that integration, so if you're interested, there'll be a link in the description. Uh, you can kind of get that information out of your boiler if you've got a Worcester Bosch like me. Um, but for now, I think we're all set up, so I can kind of consider that a success. And that's it for this video. If you've enjoyed it, please do like and subscribe. I'll put all the relevant details into the description, and if you've any questions, please use the comments to get in touch with me. And that's it. I'm Tom, and thanks for watching.